Hi, it's Nell, and thank you for joining me on my patio today because I am going to be talking about anthurium care, mainly anthurium as a long lasting and beautiful houseplant. So I upload videos every week here at YouTube. So please come back for more. And if you like gardening, house plants, flowering plants, repotting, pruning, succulents, be sure to subscribe because I would love to have you as a subscriber. And if you are new, welcome. And if you are returning, hi there, old friend. Already, anthurium care coming up. And I really wasn't planning on doing a video on post on anthurium care, but I posted a picture of an anthurium on the Joyous Garden Facebook page because every Friday I do Flower Friday, so it's all pictures of flowers. And the anthurium was one of them, and I got a lot of questions, and people sent me pictures of their anthurium, so I thought, okay. I guess people are interested in this plant, so that's why I am doing this for you. And anthuriums are native to the tropics. They love that humidity. They grow in places like South America, uh, outdoors, um, in, in places like South America, the Caribbean. Here in the States, they grow in Florida, Hawaii. I've seen them in the tropical garden at the San Diego Botanical Garden. But this is not about growing them outdoors. That's a different thing. This is about growing them indoors in your home. And anthuriums can be a little tricky to grow indoors. That's why I wanted to do this um, because I have grown them in San Francisco and I'm growing this one in Tucson. Climates are different, obviously. The humidity in San Francisco, I think it's like 60% to 75% depending on the season and how much fog and all that. Whereas Tucson, the humidity is like, I think, 15% to 30%. Can go up a little bit in the monsoon season. So it's more of a challenge to grow it here. So that's why I wanted to share what I've been doing to get mine to grow successfully and to flower. So this plant is sold as a temporary blooming plant like an orchid. Oftentimes people don't save their orchids. They just have them, you know, while they're in bloom or, you know, the bromeliad or, you know, the chrysanthemum or poinsettia or something. But if the conditions are right, it actually makes a nice house plant. It does take a little bit of effort, as I said. So if you just want it as a temporary blooming plant, uh, I want to tell you each flower lasts about five to seven weeks. So they are in bloom for a long time, you know, or they're open for a long time. You know, this is a new one here. So if you just want it as a temporary blooming plant, you really don't need to watch this, but, um, but to keep it as a house plant, keep on watching. How many times can I use keep? <laughs> So there are hundreds of species and cultivars of anthuriums out there. Many, many not sold in the houseplant trade, but this one commonly is, and this is Anthurium andreanum, and it does well. There's also some newer cultivars out of anthuriums that bloom a little bit longer too, and they have, um, and bloom almost all year long, so you can keep your eyes open for those but right now i'm going to show you some beautiful house plants that are in the same family as the gorgeous anthurium here is the beautiful anthurium surrounded by plants that are in the same family its relatives back here we have the aglaonema chinese evergreen this one is going to bloom there are those spathe type flowers they haven't unfolded quite yet but there's quite a few of them on this plant there we go the anthurium and of course the very popular piece lily which i have cut off 
some of the flowers. And then down here, also in the Araceae family, is the arrowhead plant. And you can see how some of the new growth is coming out. Pinkish, you know, because this is one of the Illusion series. I believe it is Pink Illusion. But it is pretty, and it's doing well. And I have more Eglinamas, and I have Pothos, but because Pothos are in the same family as our Monsteras, but I just didn't have enough room to bring them all out here. And before I start in on the care, here are a few fun facts. Um, this is oftentimes called the red peace lily, so it's not really a peace lily. It's just called the red peace lily because they have similar flowers. I think another name, common name for it is flamingo flower. Um, and I worked for a very large florist in San Francisco, used a lot of these plants, and the um, florist would also call them little boy flowers, as you can imagine why. I'm going to let you use your imagination on that one for these little boy flowers. So we're starting out with exposure, which is important. Um, they like bright light. They are like the spathophyllums. They like bright light, but nothing too hot and direct. You can keep them near a window, but not in, in the window. And if the light is too high, if it's too hot, it will burn. And if the light is too low, you know, the leaves are, are going to get smaller and you won't get the flowering. So it's nice to have that nice bright light. So for me, I have it in my hallway on an antique tea cart and I have my door open for most of the day now because I work at home. It is the end of May, but it's going to be heating up soon. So I'll have to turn the air conditioning on. So I might move mine into my kitchen, which has a skylight. So I'll see how it's doing with the door closed and I might need to move it. So you might have to do the same thing too, because if you aren't, aren't getting any flowering, more light. And now in terms of watering, this is important too, because this is an epiphyte. You've heard me talk about epiphytes before. Orchids are epiphytes, bromeliads are epiphytes, some of the peperomias are, you know, you know, has some of the hoyas, it means they grow on other plants and not in the soil. So they get the rain, 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 and you know, then the rain is gone. It's not setting in wet soil. So mine is actually planted in sphagnum moss. I am going to repot it next year because I've kind of been on, on a repotting spree these days. So, you know, enough is enough, but, um, it's planted in sphagnum moss. So I have been watering mine, you know, once a week in the winter, I water it like every two to three weeks because it likes to rest a little bit. And I might need to water it every five days as we heat up here. So, what you want is for it not to go like bone dry, to go almost, almost dry or, you know, slightly dry, and then you water it again. I take mine to the sink. I have a nice deep sink now. So I take and I spray the leaves to, to up the ante on the humidity factor a bit. So that is what I do. And then I just let the water drain out of the pot and then I return it to its spot. So. Uh, just be careful to not let the water beat up on, uh, on the leaves because they can be, uh, you know, subject to a fungus if the water sits for too long. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about it here because we're dry. So in the winter, I don't spray them as often. So anyway, um, that is how I water mine and you can adjust yours according to your climate and the exposure it's in. And because they are epiphytes, you don't want to keep them constantly drenching wet. And I think this is what some people do. Um, toward the end, I'm going to give you four or five, you know, reasons why people have a hard time with these plants. But this is one of them. So you have to find that fine line between giving them the water they like, but not too much because they are very subject to root rot. Let's do a little up close so you can see how glossy the leaves and the flowers are. I just wiped off the leaves 
this morning. So it, she, or he, I don't know. What do you guys call your plants? He or she? Um, it looked beautiful for you. Uh, I have a way that I clean my plants and I'm going to do a, a video, but I will touch on it in the blog post. But now we are moving on to temperature. And this is one plant that likes it warm in the daytime. So about, you know, 70 to 80 is just fine. I just keep it out of any hot or cold drafts. It doesn't like that at all. And if you go a bit cooler in the evening, especially in the winter, it is just fine. It actually prefers that. And like most houseplants, all that I know of anyway, the uh, winter time is their time to rest. This is generally the time that mine does not flower in the winter time, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into flowering at the end. Okay, here's a big one, humidity. Lots of these house plants are native to the tropics, but some just do much better in our dry homes. And this is another reason people have a hard time with this plant, not enough humidity. And I am in Tucson, which is the Sonoran Desert. Talk about dry. But mine's doing okay. It only has a few small brown tips, which you can see. There's a little, there's a, there's a little brown tip there. They aren't too bad. So... But that's because I'm, I'm going to tell you what I do to um, up, up the humidity factor. I keep a small glass filled with water behind the plant. And then I have a small diffuser, which is next to the plant. So I run the diffuser probably five days a week. Plus it smells good and it's giving out some nice cool moisture very close to the plant. So... I think that that's what's what's making this plant look so good. I like to think that anyway, but as I said, what I do in these, you know, videos is I just share my experiences with you, so that's how I do it. Or you could take a tray, uh put some pebbles in it, fill that with water, and then put put your anthuriums on top of it. That would be a good fix too. Or you could always have it in your kitchen or your bathroom if there's an, enough light in there because those rooms tend to be a little more humid than the other ones because of the water running. Feeding and fertilizing. This is one plant that I do fertilize. I, I, I fertilize my spath too because they flower. My aglanemas just all flower on their own. You know, you know they, they don't seem to need anything. My aglanema silver bay has got tons of flowers on it. So anyway, I just, uh, when I plant them, I just put, put a little bit of compost in because that sort of mimics that organic matter falling from above. And then I top it with a little bit of worm compost, not too much. But um, I use Eleanor's VF-11 as my houseplant fertilizer. I will leave a link to it in the box down below and also in the post. And I feed it monthly. It's a liquid fertilizer, so I water it in. I feed it monthly, March through October, because we have a long growing season here. So you want a fertilizer that's higher in phosphorus, and phosphorus is the middle letter. On fertilizers, you'll see N, P, K, and the P is phosphorus. The N is nitrogen, and the K is potassium. And what... um what phosphorus does is it's really good for the roots and for flowers and just the overall growth and health of the plant. So you want a fertilizer that has a good high number in the middle. And I think Eleanor's is 0 0.15, 0 0.85, and 0.55. So the phosphorus is higher. This is also what I feed my adenium or de desert rose with. Also, I'm just going to touch briefly on these few things coming up because I always write a very detailed blog post so you can check out more in there. Okay, so soil, this is also important too. As I said, mine is in, in, in the moss. It's planted in moss. I don't know if there's anything else in, in, in there besides the moss, but it feels like all moss to me. But when I go to repot this plant, I'm going to use a um, one-third moss one-third 
Coco Qua, which is a peat moss, you know, substitute, much more eco-friendly, and a third of my blend of succulent and cactus mix, because it has a lot of Coco Qua chips in it too. So you just want a, a mix that is coarse, porous, and rich. That is what it prefers. So if you don't want to do that blend, there's a couple other things that you could do. You could do uh, half of a peat-based potting soil. I use Ocean Forest, that's a brand I like, and have orchid bark, a nice coarse orchid bark. Or you could do Cymbidium orchid mix would be fine for this one. So in terms of pests, I've seen it with mealybugs and scale, but I um, have also heard that it is uh, they are susceptible to aphids. And I have done blog posts on all these. I've done videos and blog posts on aphid scale and mealybug so you can see what they look like. I will leave the links in the post. And if yours does get any type of insect, especially with aphids, it's normally on the flowers as they're unfurling or they like that tender new growth. Whereas mealybug loves to get in the nodes and scale tends to be on the stems or there can be some on the leaves, you know, because these leaves are really thick. So, or you can check underneath to be sure, or, you know, be sure to always check underneath to make sure that your beautiful anthurium doesn't have any pests. Now we are moving on to pets, like cats and dogs. And as I've said before, I don't know all this inf information by heart, but I always consult the ASPCA website to see what they have to say, and this plant is considered to be toxic to cats and dogs. Um, so you can uh, read about it. The link will be on the blog post. You can see what it does to them, and uh, then you can use your ju judgment and go from there. Woo, okay, on to the part that makes this plant so appealing. I mean, I personally love the foliage, so when it's out of bloom, I'm, I'm just happy with that too. But these are long lasting, as I said. I don't know if I said that earlier. Hmm, I think I did. <laughs> but they last about six to seven weeks and they don't all come at one time. I think there's only five on now. I had more on it, but there's only five on it now, but each one lasts a while. And this one is a new one uh, or a newer one because as you can see, the spadix is still a yellowish color as opposed to these are a bit older. So they're green. And then as it ages, this will turn brownish and this will lose a lot of its color too. Here's one just unfurling here. So um they are quite beautiful and they're long long lasting cut flowers also oh and also these uh these flowers can also be found in white pink purple and then there's some bicolor ones that are like red and green and i think there's one that's a, like a white and a purplish so there are different variegations of it i think there's one that's a pink and a green also so there are some other options out there for you if you don't like red. And now mine flowers, um, mine came into flower probably in February, mid, you know, February or the end of, and end of February. And now it is the end of May and it's still in bloom. I don't know if there's going to be any more coming on it anytime soon. It's probably due for its, you know, feeding. So it might go through a little bit of a rest period before, it, you know, it puts out, out more. But, but in San Francisco, mine almost, you know, it, it would flower like constantly for like seven months or so. And then the winters there are, you know, fairly gray. Well, well, actually the summers can be gray too. <laughs> if you've ever been to or lived in San Francisco, but mine um, didn't flower for quite, quite as long as it does here, but we have a lot of sunlight in Arizona. So here are the most common reasons that this plant doesn't do well as a house plant for some people. Um, first thing is it doesn't get enough light. I'm out on my patio 
It's a north facing exposure. It's a covered patio. So this is beautiful light for this plant. Even, even though it lives inside, <laughs> it is be beautiful exposure. But um, other reason is they keep it too wet because it is very subject to root rot. Another reason is improper soil mix planted all in, in, in like a heavier potting soil. It won't do well then because it doesn't dry out enough or it stays just too wet. And if the humidity is not high enough, you've got to get the humidity up above, uh, probably like if you can get it above, you know, 60% if you can, that is when this plant does well indoors. So that's why I have the diffuser next to mine and I also have a glass of water in the back and I spray the foliage off in the, you know, in the warmer months, you know, just to give it a little more moisture temporarily surrounding it. So all the other details on this glorious plant will be in the blog post. I'm going to do a section good to know. So uh, there will be some things in there that you will probably want to check out. Again, the link to the post will be down below and also on my blog, my website, actually. <laughs> joyousgarden.com. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, these are generally used as a tabletop plant or in mixed plantings. There are some big ones, but you don't see it as often sold as, as a floor plant. It's more, uh, much more commonly sold as a tabletop plant. They are, uh, this is a six inch size. Uh, they, I've also seen them in four inch. So if you want to try one, you might want to try to four inch one because it's a little less expensive. Actually, these aren't that, that expensive, surprisingly. Um, so it, it's not like you're buying a, a, you know, 10 foot, you know, Kentia palm that can set you back a couple thousand. Um, I can't remember how much I paid for this one. It, it was a while ago. It might've been $12. I don't know. I don't know something like that. Not too much though, but it's a great plant. They are beautiful. So if you want, give one a try. So I hope you have found this video about Anthurium Care, and I hope you will find the blog post on Anthurium Care to be helpful. I have a lot more videos coming your way, so stay tuned for those. I still have a bunch of ones on repotting. I have to post and I got some more houseplant care ones. I have some gardening ones. So there's all kinds of things coming up. And you know, I, th I thank you for your likes and your subscribes. I appreciate them very much. Now let's get out in the garden or into our indoor gardens because mine lives indoors and make our worlds a more beautiful place. I thank you so much for watching and I will catch you in the next video. Bye.